Good afternoon and welcome to the final presentation of our 10th annual Sacred Trust History Talks and Book Signing event presented by the Gettysburg Foundation and Gettysburg National Military Park. My name is Dan Welch and I'm the Education Programs Coordinator for the Gettysburg Foundation, which is the nonprofit partner of the National Park Service here at Gettysburg. Over the years, as we've presented Sacred Trust, we've had the distinct pleasure of hosting renowned Civil War historians, authors, National Park Service rangers, and licensed battlefield guides, so that they can share with you their unique perspectives on the Battle of Gettysburg. Coming up next, Mr. Dan Vermilia will be discussing Sherman, Kennesaw Mountain, and the Atlanta Campaign. The Battle of Kennesaw Mountain was one of the most lopsided defeats of William Tecumseh Sherman's military career. Yet, this defeat occurred in the midst of one of Sherman's greatest overall victories, the Atlanta Campaign. This presentation will look at Sherman's defeat at Kennesaw Mountain and how that battle impacted both Sherman and his army during the campaign for Atlanta. Daniel Vermilia is a Civil War historian who works as a park ranger at Antietam National Battlefield. He has also worked as a National Park Service Ranger at Gettysburg National Military Park. In 2012, he was the first recipient of the Save Historic Antietam Foundation's Joseph L. Harsh Memorial Scholar Award. Please welcome my colleague, my friend, Mr. Daniel Vermilia. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's good to be here. Uh, this is the end of a very busy two-week stretch for me. Uh, I have been down in Georgia speaking at Kennesaw. Now I'm up here in Pennsylvania, so I'm just all over the place. Um, but it is very good to be here. I want to thank Dan and everybody with the Gettysburg Foundation and, of course, here at the park, Gettysburg National Military Park, for all the work that goes into these, these lectures. Uh, there's a lot of behind-the-scenes work, and these guys deserve a lot of credit. Well, for our lecture today, uh, we're not going to be talking about the Eastern Theater here, but we are talking about events 150 years ago. In 1864, of course, the Civil War had entered its final year, its climactic year, in many ways the worst year of the Civil War. In cities all across the country, Virginia, Georgia, of course, being the main theaters at that point, landscapes, backyards, these scenes began to look like this, military scenes with sharpened stakes, armies, and trenches transforming peaceful landscapes into military scenes. Of course, that was a pivotal year. There were huge events hanging in the balance. What happened in these campaigns in Virginia and Georgia would dictate the future of American history, especially in the state of Georgia, where Union forces under the command of William Tecumseh Sherman were pushing south toward Atlanta. And not to give away the ending here too much, but of course, the eventual Union uh, success in Atlanta is thought by many historians to be the key element in re-electing President Abraham Lincoln in November of 1864. Well, in the midst of all this, there is the storyline of a man, William Tecumseh Sherman, who had many setbacks and many defeats in his life, a man who at different times in his life was thought to be insane, multiple times thought to be insane, a man who failed in many business ventures, and a man who during this grand push towards Atlanta in 1864, perhaps one of the most significant Union campaigns of the war, he had a major setback, a major failure at Kennesaw Mountain. So I thought what we'd do today is look at Sherman, this key figure, who I'm sure many Americans are familiar with his name, and look at how he comes to be this man who has these major successes and how he overcomes these failures, one of them, the one we'll talk about, being at Kennesaw Mountain. Of course, in the Atlanta campaign, we have two commanders, Sherman and Joe Johnston, each very accomplished generals in their own right. But of course, we are focusing on Sherman, and I thought it would be worth pointing out. I don't think I'll have to worry about this here today, but while I was in Georgia, on one of the talks I was doing, uh, one of the ranger programs actually at Kennesaw Mountain at the park there, I held up a picture of Sherman and just asked the crowd, hey, does anyone know who this guy is? And some lady shouted out, well, that's the devil. <laughs> so I thought, well, now I have my opening joke for my Sacred Trust lecture. But, of course, it shows you just a little bit of the difference of perspective of speaking out sh about Sherman in uh, southern Pennsylvania as opposed to speaking about Sherman in Georgia. But Sherman has a very interesting backstory. Born in Ohio in 1820, his father died when he was very, very young. He was raised by the prominent Ewing family, Thomas Ewing, 
being, of course, a senator from Ohio, and very appropriate to mention this here at Gettysburg National Military Park, but he was the first Secretary of the Interior. Well, being raised by the Ewing family mean that Sher meant that Sherman had important connections, connections that could get him appointed to West Point, where he entered at the age of 16, graduated there in 1840. He was very close friends with George Thomas while at West Point, and he also was classmates with another general, who I'm sure many of you are familiar here at Gettysburg, Richard Ewell. Upon graduating from West Point in 1840, Sherman held several different posts in the United States Army. He ended up missing out on the Mexican War, although he did see some action, some service in the Seminole Wars in Florida in the 1840s. He married Ellen Ewing, one of the many daughters, one of the many children, I should say, of Thomas Ewing, married her in 1850, and in 1853, Sherman resigned from the Army. He tried several civilian pursuits, among them running a bank branch in San Francisco. His salary was not very much. In 1854, his family expenses were one-third more than double his salary. So he's working very hard, and he's having a very difficult time supporting his family. He's having asthma attacks. He's having stress attacks. Ultimately, the bank in San Francisco fails. So in 1857, he runs a bank in New York. Well, of course, for those of you familiar with American history, you might remember that there's this little thing called the Panic of 1857, meaning that, yes, his bank in New York is going to fail as well. He moves to Kansas to practice law in 1858. One of his law partners, a young man by the name of Dan McCook, who we'll hear about a little bit later on, who would cross paths with Sherman later on in this story. He fails as a lawyer. In 1859, he finally gets a good job. He's a superintendent of a military academy in Louisiana. Well, of course, that's in 1859. And what should happen just a short while later? Southern states seceding from the Union. Thus, in early 1861, Sherman has to yet again leave another job He'll work on a uh, streetcar company in St. Louis for a few months, but in May of 1861, he is back in the Army fighting for Union forces. He's engaged at first Manassas in July of 61, and his star begins to rise quickly after that. He's sent to Kentucky, where he ends up taking over the large command in the state of Kentucky after Robert Anderson. Well, of course, as a story known to many, familiar with Civil War history and with the story of William Tecumseh Sherman, the stresses of this command were simply too much for him. In November of 1861, Sherman asked to be relieved. He had what we might think of today as a nervous breakdown. A Cincinnati newspaper famously declared William T. Sherman is insane. He essentially had to be sent home to Ohio for several weeks to recuperate and rest and essentially take a step back. So here's a man at this point in late 1861 who had every reason in the world to just give up to just not try anymore, to not get back in the game. He didn't have to serve in any more military capacities. He had failed in numerous pursuits. Yet, he doesn't give up. He finds another way. By early 1862, he's serving under the command of Henry Halleck in Missouri. He's helping with logistical support for Grant's campaigns against Forts Donelson and Henry in northern Tennessee. And in March of 1862, Sherman finds himself a division commander under Grant. And of course, that leads us to perhaps one of the most important stories, or chapters, excuse me, in Sherman's story, the Battle of Shiloh. This is where Sherman finds his redemption, and he begins essentially being remade into the commander who would eventually take Atlanta in September of 1864. Sherman's men were initially caught off guard at Shiloh, caught in the thick of the fighting on the southern end of the Union encampment, but they're going to they're going to do their commander proud. The men under his command will fight bravely. They will fight proudly. Sherman himself, wounded in the hand, does not give up. On the night of the 6th, Grant and Sherman begin what we might think of as a very strong friendship, a bond that will last throughout the rest of the war, have a famous meeting underneath an oak tree. Sherman telling Grant, well, Grant, we've had the devil's own day, haven't we? Grant responds, yes, we'll lick them tomorrow, though. Well, from this point on, Sherman's star is rising. Throughout 1862, he is an important post as the essentially military governor of Memphis after Memphis, Tennessee falls to Union forces. He's going to restore order to the city there. He plays a major role in the fighting around Vicksburg. He suffered a tremendous setback at Chickasaw Bluffs on December 29th of 1862, launching a frontal assault against well-fortified Confederate forces. This is something we will hear about in a little bit, another pattern developing perhaps. After the fall of Vicksburg, Grant 
becoming the commander of the Union Department of the Mississippi. And Sherman will then take command of the Army of the Tennessee, leading that force in action at Chattanooga, where he will again have some setbacks trying to attack one end of the Confederate line. But ultimately, at the end of 1863, despite these setbacks outside of Vicksburg, these defeats at Chickasaw Bluffs, the setbacks outside of Chattanooga in November, Sherman is in a key position for Union military forces. As the war in 1863 begins to transition into the war in 1864, the fighting itself will transition from Tennessee into Georgia. And along with that, there's a transition at the top of Union command. Yes, these same two men who at various points in their lives would have been described most aptly by the word complete and utter failures are now the two leading Union commanders. One of the many ironies of history how things work out this way. Grant, a man who in the 1850s had to pawn a watch for money for his family. Sherman, a man who in 1861 was declared insane by newspapers. Grant now becomes the Lieutenant General commanding all Union forces and Sherman becomes the man leading Union forces in the war's Western theater. And thinking back to that conversation under the tree at Shiloh, now we have a friendship, now we have cooperation, now we have a partnership leading Union forces. At no point during the Civil War did Confederates enjoy this type of a partnership at that high a level of command. Sherman and Grant would now advance against Confederate forces at the same time. Grant, of course, taking on Robert E. Lee in Virginia, and Sherman now pushing south into the state of Georgia. And as Sherman pushes south into the state of Georgia, he's also going to find new Confederate leadership. Of course, pictured here, General Joseph Johnston and Confederate President Jefferson Davis. And I included this slide almost as a foil to the one we just talked about. Uh, of course, while cooperation and partnership are the terms that best describe Sherman and Grant, anything but that for Johnston and Davis. These are two men who bickered constantly on matters both big and small. Of course, most significantly, those big matters, matters of military strategy, matters of military tactics. How are they best going to advance the Confederate cause? Especially in the Western theater, where Johnston finds himself commanding the Confederate Army of Tennessee in early 1864. Well, Davis wanted Johnston to essentially launch an attack right against Sherman's forces centered around Chattanooga. Johnston instead preferred to fight a defensive campaign, wait for Sherman to advance on him, defeat Sherman in a major battle, and then push north, push Sherman's forces back into Tennessee. Ultimately, we will see this disagreement in Confederate command and the agreement in federal command are going to play a big factor in the Atlanta campaign. And thus, with 1864, the final climactic year of the Civil War, Grant will move south against Lee, engaging in a fierce, bloody struggle across Virginia. Sherman will move south against Johnston. He has two primary objectives. One, attack the Confederate Army of Tennessee. Do as much damage to Johnston as he possibly can. Pursue that army. Damage Confederate resources. Damage the war-making ability of the South. And as he's moving south, he's going to be moving across some very difficult terrain in northern Georgia, terrain that Sherman himself had seen before. In 1844, as a young army officer stationed in Charleston, South Carolina, Sherman had an assignment of traveling through northern Georgia and assessing pension claims from men who had fought in the Seminole Wars. Well, during this time, Sherman traveled to places such as Marietta, Georgia, such as the Alatoona Pass, and yes, places such as Kennesaw Mountain. And thus, this is not unfamiliar terrain for William T. Sherman. This is familiar ground which he will be traversing. Of course, the difference, instead of a young army lieutenant, now he is a major general with 100,000 men under his command. And thus, in the first week of May, 1864, Sherman will begin pushing south. <clears throat> and Sherman himself realized the importance of this. He realized that the task that lay ahead was severe. It would be difficult. It would be challenging. In March of 1864, he had written to his wife, saying, All that has gone before is mere skirmishing. The war now begins. With heavy, well-disciplined masses, the issue must be settled in hard-fought battles. Well, that quote, of course, very telling about Sherman's mindset, but it might perhaps be best describing what goes on in Virginia in May of 1864, the opening of the Overland Campaign, where Grant and Lee will throw their armies at one another, almost engaging in something we might compare to a rugby match, with players on each side having blood streaming down from their foreheads. Well, in Georgia... 
There are not these major climactic battle, battles being fought. Sherman and Johnston are engaging in a chess match, especially with Sherman, continuing try, continuously trying to outflank his opponent, to outmaneuver his opponent. Johnston setting up position in strong defensive terrain. Sherman, knowing better, prefers not to attack that defensive terrain, prefers to go around. And thus a pattern develops in May of 1864, Johnston taking up a strong defensive position, first at Rocky Face Ridge outside of Dalton, then at Resaca, then down to Cassville, then down to the Alatoona Pass, time and again thinking, aha, now I have my moment, now I have the terrain where Sherman will attack. And time and again, Sherman, instead of attacking, will try to outflank Johnston's men. Well, by late May of 1864, this campaign had ground into a halt in what soldiers from both sides remembered as the hellhole of Georgia. Sherman trying to outflank Johnston, moving far to the south of his key rail line, the Western and Atlantic Railroad. One rail line he is using to supply his massive army in Georgia. In the hellhole of Georgia, a pattern develops of daily, grueling skirmishing. Sam Watkins, a soldier from Tennessee, who wrote one of the, perhaps the best memoirs any soldier left us of the American Civil War, described the Atlanta campaign as a hundred days battle. And that description really, really is meaningful and is perhaps best applied to what begins in the hellhole of Georgia, this brutal fighting in late May of 1864 with both armies grinding at each other daily, wearing each other down daily. Well, after this fighting in the hellhole of Georgia, Outside of Dallas, Sherman will return to the Western and Atlantic Railroad, a rail line which ran past the city of Marietta, and on its way towards the city of Marietta, it passed Kennesaw Mountain. Here's a wartime sketch of Marietta, Georgia, and in the distance you can see the twin peaks of Big Kennesaw and Little Kennesaw Mountain. Big Kennesaw rising 1,800 feet above sea level, about 800 feet above, above the surrounding terrain and Little Kennesaw rising about 600 feet above the surrounding train. Well, of course, this rail line, this crucial supply line for Sherman and his men runs right past Big Kennesaw, meaning that for Joseph Johnston and the Confederates, this is a good piece of terrain to hold. And thus, by mid-June of 1864, on June 19th, Joseph Johnston and his Army of Tennessee, three corps strong, will take position around Kennesaw Mountain. And now, the peaceful slopes of Kennesaw, what is today Kennesaw Mountain National Battlefield Park, it will see these two armies settling into, once again, this pattern of daily, grueling combat. The threat of death every day for soldiers in the ranks. And trenches like these are home to soldiers at this point in the war. Trenches where they are living and fighting and, yes, dying day after day after day. Trenches that stretch for miles around Kennesaw Mountain, and trenches which, for those who have been to Kennesaw Mountain National Battlefield Park, for those who are familiar with this terrain, many of these trenches and earthworks still exist, making Kennesaw one of the real uh, treasures of the National Park Service and the Civil War battlefields that the Park Service holds. As I said, I was just down in Georgia a week ago, and I had the privilege a week ago today of leading ranger programs for the park down there on some of these earthworks, or near some of these earthworks, earthworks I should say. And they are just an outstanding example showing us what this terrain must have been like for the men fighting 150 years ago. Well, from the perspective of William T. Sherman, of course, he is not necessarily in these trenches on the front line, but this daily grueling combat is wearing him down as well. On June 22nd, Sherman, positioning men on the southern end of his line, was trying to once again outflank Johnston's position. The problem for Sherman and his men that day was they encountered a man by the name, familiar to, I'm guessing, most folks here, John Bell Hood. Joseph Johnston positioned Hood on the southern end of the Confederate line, using him to essentially try to block this Federal advance. Hood, thinking that the best defense was a good offense that day, launched an attack headlong into Union lines. And in the span of 90 minutes, well over 1,000 Confederates would fall as casualties in the Battle of Kolb's Farm. What this meant for Sherman and the Federals, it was a clear signal. It was a signal that, yes, Johnston's left flank was quite strong. It was a signal that perhaps trying to outflank Johnston here might not be the best idea. It was a signal that perhaps there's a better way to get past Kennesaw Mountain. And thus, two days later, on June 24th of 1864, 
Sherman decides to launch an attack. He issues what is known as Special Orders 28. The orders launching an attack against Kennesaw Mountain on June 27th of 1864. This is to consist of two main assaults. An assault consisting of the Army of V, Tennessee, commanded by James B. McPherson, launching three brigades against Confederates at a place known as Pigeon Hill. And it's also to consist as of a strong assault by the Army of the Cumberland, commanded by George Thomas, five brigades sent against the center of the Confederate line. Why does he do this? Well, I don't know. That's a good question. Why does he do this? Well, there's a couple different reasons. From Sherman's perspective, he had been receiving dispatches in the days leading up to these orders from various commanders, among them George Thomas, his West Point classmate and friend, commanding the bulk of Sherman's army, the Army of the Cumberland. Thomas telling Sherman that everywhere his lines were spreading out, they were finding Confederates. And perhaps more importantly, the Federal lines were now becoming too thin. Thus, it would stand to reason, logic would dictate that Sherman, having more men, if everywhere his ever-thinning lines are spreading to, everywhere they are encountering Confederates, then perhaps, knowing that the Confederates have fewer men, then perhaps the Confederate lines were even thinner and even weaker. And thus, perhaps it makes sense. Perhaps you can pierce the Confederate line. Perhaps there are a few places where a well-positioned and strong infantry assault might be able to cut through Johnston's Kennesaw line might be able to finally break this pattern of stalemate and stagnation that had developed around Kennesaw Mountain. Legitimate reasons? Sure, that makes sense in hindsight. For the men in the ranks here at Kennesaw Mountain on June 27, 1864, perhaps they did not think there were legitimate reasons, but it was their duty to carry these orders forward nonetheless. Over the next two days, the 25th, 26th of June, men in the ranks are preparing so many are not told of the attack until the morning of the 27th. Army commanders are preparing for the assault. George Thomas, commanding the Army of the Cumberland, will pick several places for his men to attack. The men underneath his command, they will pick places for the men to attack as well. Officers are preparing, and men are continuing the daily pattern of skirmishing, stagnation, fighting, and dying. And thus, the morning of June 27, 1864, will arrive and the Battle of Kennesaw Mountain will begin very early on. Well, against the main slopes of the mountain itself, there was not to be a main assault against the mountain itself, but several regiments of Union infantry were pushed forward as a skirmishing force, believing that perhaps if the Confederates are as thin along their lines as we think they are, perhaps they are thinnest and weakest along the big peaks of Big Kennesaw and Little Kennesaw, and thus perhaps only a few Union regiments can break through the line there. Of course, the other reason for this is to keep Johnston's lines spread out so that when these main attacks are launched, the Confederates won't concentrate against these attacking Union soldiers. Several hundred Union casualties will fall against the slopes of Big Kennesaw, but to little avail. To the south is where the main assault, or the secondary of these main assaults, is to occur against a very rocky, very wooded hillside known as Pigeon Hill, rising over 400 feet above the surrounding terrain, perhaps a spur on the southern side of Little Kennesaw Mountain. Well, there are to be three brigades attacking against Pigeon Hill. Among these men of the Army of the Tennessee on the morning of June 27th, Captain Alva Stone Skilton noted, this column has been selected as a forlorn hope, and we are expected to carry the enemy's works in our front. Captain Jacob Augustine of the 55th Illinois noted, our division takes the lead. Now may God protect the right. I'm doubting our success. Well, shortly after 8 a.m., several thousand Union soldiers would rush forward towards the wooded hillside of Pigeon Hill, encountering several thousand Confederate soldiers prepared to meet their advance. And as I noted earlier, one of the best parts of Kennesaw Mountain today are the preserved earthworks. And this is just one of those examples. This is one of the trenches that Confederates and Brigadier General Francis Cockrell's brigade, Missouri soldiers fighting for the South on top of Pigeon Hill, this is where they are located, looking down the long slope as Federals from three brigades are charging forward into the ranks. As one private from Indiana noted, the scene of this fight, this day's fight, beggars all description. The brigades of Charles Walcott, 
Giles Smith and Joseph Lightburn are charging forward into a storm of shot and shell. One lieutenant from Missouri fighting for the Confederacy noted it was really sickening to see those brave fellows struggling up that valley. Our infantry did not return their rammers as usual after loading, but stuck them in the ground and snatched them up when wanted to save time. No troops could stand such a concentrated fire for long. Captain Skilton in the 57th Ohio noted, the place was almost inaccessible to one unencumbered and unopposed. And for those who have hiked up the slopes of Pigeon Hill today, that quote has special relevance. It is a steep climb, even without the encumbrances of a wool uniform, muskets, and men firing at you from these trenches. Brigadier General Charles Walcott, one of the officers leading these men up the slopes, noted, a line never struggled harder to succeed, but it was not in human power. By 10 a.m., this assault had failed. Nearly 600 casualties had fallen in two hours. The, the assault by the Army of the Tennessee had not come close to breaking through the Confederate line. But to the south, at a place known today as Cheatham Hill, after Major General Benjamin Franklin Cheatham, one of the Confederate officers commanding that part of the line, that is where the main assault was to be launched. Five brigades from the Union Army of the Cumberland. Three brigades from the Fourth Corps, commanded by yet another name familiar to those here at Gettysburg, Oliver O. Howard, and two brigades, commanded by the uh, 14th Corps Division of Jefferson C. Davis, Jefferson C. Davis's division of the 14th Corps. And here are the earthworks where Cheatham's men were positioned. Cheatham's division was described by one Union officer as the flower of the Southern Army. These are well-positioned earthworks. The men had had several days to position these, these lines, to dig these trenches and prepare for what was to come. And by the morning of the 27th, Union forces are charging forward into a severe musket and artillery fire. There are several guns positioned along the line here. One Confederate soldier from Arkansas noted our cannon were placed for execution. By 9 a.m., the Army of the Cumberland is ready to begin. There is a short artillery barrage, not lasting nearly as long as the famed artillery barrage here at Gettysburg on July 3rd of 1863, but there is a short sustained artillery barrage preparing for the Union assault. Some Confederates that morning had uh, stretched blankets out on top of the trenches because it was a very hot day. It was over 100 degrees that day. They were protecting themselves from the Georgia sun. But as soon as the Federal shells began exploding above their heads, they quickly scampered down into the trenches and awaited the Union assault. And as Union soldiers begin pushing forward, they are doing so knowing the risks, knowing what they are charging forward to. As Jacob Andervown, a soldier in the 19th Ohio, wrote in his diary that day, observing the columns charging forward, he noted that the men were charging forward, quote, to death or a southern prison. And it's worth noting that, yes, these are battle veterans at this point in the war. They do understand what these orders mean. They understand what charging fortified lines will likely do to them and their comrades. One private from Arkansas noted, if any command was ever given for us to commence firing, I never heard it. An Ohioan named Henry Gilman Shedd wrote, the bullets, grape, and canister shot flew thick, amazingly thick and fast. It seemed almost impossible for any of us to escape. <clears throat> One captain on the staff of Patrick Claiborne, another of the Confederate division commanders holding this stretch of the line, noted the slaughter was terrific as our troops literally mowed them down. Some of the Federal officers would try to take cover, take shelter, against the downslope of the Confederate earthworks, the parapet. Among them, Captain John Tuttle of the 3rd Kentucky, who noted the concussions from the enemy's cannon nearly unjointed my neck, and the heat from them burnt my face. Well, as these 4th Corps soldiers are charging forward, the Confederate fire is simply too much for them to overcome. And in these three brigades, there are well over 600 casualties as these men are mowed down on the slopes, charging up forward towards the Confederate line. But to the south of where these 4th Corps soldiers are attacking, to the south where the men of the 14th Corps are positioned, two brigades under the command of 25-year-old Colonel John Mitchell and 29-year-old Colonel Dan McCook. Yes, the same Dan McCook I mentioned earlier. The same Dan McCook who in 1858 was witness to Sherman as a lawyer, was one of Sherman's law partners. 
Thus, he was there earlier for one of Sherman's other failures in his, in his civilian career. And now, years later, he's commanding a column sent forward against Confederate lines at Kennesaw Mountain against perhaps one of the best positioned Confederate lines in the Atlanta campaign, perhaps some of the best defended Confederate lines in the Atlanta campaign. Well, McCook's men, along with those of John Mitchell's command, are charging forward against a point in the Confederate works known as the Dead Angle. It's known as the Dead Angle in part because of the way the terrain dips, leaving a dead spot in the sight lines of Confederate soldiers at the top of the hill. It's also known as the Dead Angle because of what occurred there on June 27th of 1864. One captain from Tennessee noted as the men of Mitchell's command were pouring forward towards the Confederate lines. <clears throat> At times from the roar and smoke of battle, we fought neither by sound nor sight. The air was so full of sulfurous smoke we could not see, and the roar of musketry so continuous we could not distinguish the report of our guns from that of the one by our side, and could only tell by the rebound of the gun whether it had gone off or not. Of course, to the left of Mitchell's brigade charging forward into these Tennessee soldiers is the brigade of Dan McCook himself, who will famously recite a stanza of poetry from Horatius by Thomas Babington Macaulay, one of the lines in there being, facing fearful odds, facing fearful odds. The poetry talks about men charging forward into fearful odds, and that is exactly what McCook's men did that day 150 years ago. He said, then out spake brave Horatius, the captain of the gate. Death cometh upon this earth to every man, soon or late. And how can man die better than facing fearful odds for the ashes of his fathers and the temples of his gods? And no sooner had Sherman's former law partner recited these lines than the command to charge forward was given. And as these men are charging forward, they are advancing against that dead angle, where men such as Sam Watkins from Tennessee are positioned, pouring a murderous fire into the federal lines. Sam Watkins, of course, in his famed memoir, Company H, later wrote, it seemed impossible to check the onslaught, but every man was true to his trust, and he seemed to think that at that moment the whole responsibility of the Confederate government was rested upon his shoulders. He continued writing, afterward I heard a soldier express himself by saying that he thought hell had broke loose in Georgia, sure enough. Well, among the slain at the dead angle is Colonel Dan, this former law partner, of William Sherman's. McCook will ru run right up to the Confederate parapet, put his foot on top of the head logs, on top of the Confederate trenches, shouting, waving his sword, a Confederate put his musket right up to McCook's chest and fire. McCook falls back mortally wounded. Carried home, eventually sent home to Steubenville in Ohio, where he would die on July 17th of 1864, just five days short of his 30th birthday. Along with McCook, many other men from Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois are slain at the dead angle as they are cut down. Watkins later wrote that he estimated every man killed from 20 to 100 Union soldiers each. Of course, of course he's writing with some hyperbole there, but the sentiment remains true. It was a very easy task to mow down these attacking federal soldiers. For the men in the ranks, there simply was no choice but to begin falling back. With officers falling all around them, these men have to retire but they will not fall all the way back towards their starting position. Instead, they'll only fall back perhaps 30 to 40 yards down the slope of the hill, and they will dig in with trench lines, using anything they can, using their hands, using plates, bayonets to put up earth between themselves and their opponents. Well, as these men are digging in, they're doing anything they can to stay, to stay near federal lines. And it is, excuse me, stay near Confederate lines, and it is a failed assault for the men of Sherman's command. There is death and suffering across the battlefield on June 27th, pictured here a famous scene where Confederate soldiers from Arkansas, led by Colonel William Martin, actually initiate a ceasefire because some of the impediments, the wooden impediments and the dry leaves in front of their earthworks had caught fire from the blasts of their cannon. So Union soldiers trapped on the battlefield with flames all around them. Of course, this is a horrible assault for Sherman's men. But what about Sherman himself? We've now heard a little bit about the horrors, the terrors of Kennesaw Mountain for the men under his command. But what about Sherman himself? Well, throughout much of June 27th, Sherman, at his headquarters near Cheatham Hill, essentially at a telegraph station, he's receiving telegraph messages from various generals across his line. 
One of those generals is George Thomas, who is repeatedly sending Sherman messages telling him how poorly things are going for men under his command. Among those messages, uh, note late in the, excuse me, in the middle afternoon on the 27th, saying one or two more such assaults would use up this army. With messages such as this coming in, Sherman will quickly, quickly realize the error of his ways. He will quickly realize that this attack had been a failure, and thus he needs to look elsewhere to push through Johnston's lines. In the days afterwards, Sherman would react to what happened at Kennesaw, writing these famous lines to his wife in a letter, noting, I begin to regard the death and mangling of a couple thousand men as a small affair, a kind of morning dash, and it may be well that we become so hardened. Each day is killed or wounded some valuable officers and men, the bullets coming from a concealed foe. Well, Sherman had learned his lesson at Kennesaw, and soon he would begin a return to flanking movements. In fact, on the night of June 27th, after receiving these messages from George Thomas, Sherman decided once again to begin concentrating federal forces for a push around the left flank of Joseph Johnston's army. For Sherman, this meant leaving that all-important Western and Atlantic Railroad, swinging away from the railroad once again. Thus, he paused several days to accumulate supplies to leave the railroad so his men would not go without food. <clears throat> By July 1st, Sherman believed enough food had been stored up, enough supplies had been gathered, they could begin maneuvering. And on July 2nd, men begin to shift south. Well, of course, on Kennesaw Mountain, it being a great place to view the surrounding countryside, is Joseph Johnston and the Confederate Army, witnessing much of this. Johnston, realizing that Sherman is maneuvering once again on the night of July 2nd, pulls back from his Kennesaw line. He will retreat. He will retreat from these strong positions at Kennesaw Mountain, back to the Chattahoochee River. Eventually, he will retreat across the Chattahoochee River. And that was the final straw for Joseph Johnston. This poor working relationship with Jefferson Davis could be maintained no longer. And once Johnston had fallen back across the Chattahoochee, soon Sherman and his legions had pushed across the Chattahoochee, and were, they were on the doorstep of Atlanta. On July 17th of 1864, Johnston was relieved of command being replaced by none other than John Bell Hood, yes, of Gettysburg fame. And thus, the siege of Atlanta will begin. And I say siege of Atlanta, noting that there were several battles around the city. On July 20th, Peachtree Creek. On July 22nd, the Battle of Atlanta itself, just east of the city. On July 28th, Ezra Church. But despite there being these fierce battles around the city, Sherman was fighting using defensive tactics using siege tactics. He would not launch another assault like he had at Kennesaw Mountain. Instead, he would try to envelop the city, cut the rail lines, and attack Atlanta and save as many of his own men as he could. Ultimately, this proved successful for Sherman and those under his command. Atlanta would fall on September 2nd of 1864, Sherman writing the following day, so Atlanta is ours and fairly won. And for Sherman, this was a key moment in the war. He had risen from a man declared insane in 1861 to a man who had delivered a victory that was perhaps the final nail in the coffin for the Confederacy, a victory that would virtually ensure the re-election of Abraham Lincoln in 1864, leaving great destruction in his wake, some of that destruction caused by Hood and the Confederates, some to be caused by Sherman and the men under his command. And all the while, Sherman had done this, seizing Atlanta, by destroying railroads with siege tactics, not launching frontal assaults like he had at Kennesaw, but launching frontal assaults perhaps against rail lines themselves. And of course, from Atlanta, the story is very familiar. Many history books have throughout the last 150 years marked Sherman's march to the sea from November to December of 1864, the march for which Sherman and his men are most famous, cutting a swath through Georgia, as Sherman famously noted, making Georgia howl. Marching to Savannah, seizing Savannah as a Christmas present for the newly reelected President Abraham Lincoln, and then moving on through the Carolinas, burning large portions of Columbia, moving on into North Carolina, where in April of 1865, he accepted the surrender of Confederate General Joseph Johnston the same man who had soundly repulsed Sherman's columns at Kennesaw Mountain on June 27th of 1864. 
And thus Sherman rides as one of the victorious generals of the war for the Union Army. Again, this man who had risen from failure after failure after failure after failure. If we look to history for lessons, if we look to history for inspiration, surely the story of William Tecumseh Sherman is one of both lessons and inspiration on not giving up, on not settling for failure, on always finding ways to, despite what anybody says, despite if newspapers are literally calling you insane, do not give up. But what role does Kennesaw Mountain really play in all of this? It is, especially by the scale of places like Gettysburg, a small battle. It lasted just a few hours on the morning of June 27, 1864. It was a battle that saw in about three hours 3,000 Union casualties, an alarming rate, no doubt. Confederate forces, very low losses. The division of Patrick Claiborne only had 11 recorded casualties. Johnson's army had far fewer than 1,000 casualties on the 27th. It was the biggest Confederate victory of the Atlanta campaign. But as noted earlier, it's a Confederate victory in a campaign that is a Union victory. It is a Confederate victory in a campaign that saw a tremendous Union success across the board. And for Sherman and those under his command, it was a battle that provided lessons. It was a battle that taught them how to succeed in 1864 against fortified lines. Sherman learned lessons at Kennesaw to never do that again, to never launch an assault like that again, and he never would. Those under his command learned lessons as well. One of them, Bill Raff of the 19th Ohio wrote, I suppose that we will have to flank the enemy out of their positions, as we have been doing. It was so reported that General Sherman made the charges on June 27th to show to his army that he would charge the enemy wherever he saw it expedient to do so. I am in hopes that we may be able to flank the enemy out of their position here, for I do not like the idea of charging their works. I saw and heard enough on the 27th to do me for a few days. Well, those words were true for Sherman as well, as he would never again charge fortified Confederate lines. He had learned his lessons at Kennesaw Mountain. He had learned that there were other ways, perhaps, to attack Confederate positions. And thus, 150 years later, when we look at the lessons of Kennesaw for Sherman and the men under his command, we realize that it was one test as a part of a very large, very challenging campaign, a campaign that might be summarized best by images like this one, images from the Marietta National Cemetery in Marietta, Georgia, where thousands upon thousands of Union soldiers who gave their lives in 1864 in Georgia are now resting. And perhaps the best words to describe the sacrifice of these men under the command of Sherman, men who, like Sherman, learned from failure and ultimately succeeded, perhaps the best words are those of yet another Ohioan, Lieutenant George Hurlbut of the 14th Battery Ohio Light Artillery, who just weeks after Kennesaw Mountain wrote home saying, need I tell you that we are a weary, jaded, yet confident army. For four long weeks we have been within the sound of cannon and musketry, and the end is not yet. In all history, there is nothing that will compare with this campaign of General Sherman's. Here we are, 125 miles from our base of supplies. I dare not contemplate what would be the result should the enemy destroy the railroad in our rear, over which comes food for both men and horses. But I must not dream of anything but victory. It is certain that we have thus far been successful, driving an immense army before us through their own country. Our losses have been severe. Many brave men have fallen in battle, and many have died from disease. They have fallen in defense of principles that will never die. Well, if you have the chance to ever visit Kennesaw Mountain National Battlefield Park, these are the stories that that park tells. I want to thank you all very much for your time this afternoon. Uh, thank you all for coming out here and for taking part in the Sacred Trust lectures. I believe we're going to have time for some questions now. All right. Thank you very much. From what you described of the uh, Battle of Kennesaw Mountain, it, it seems that Battle of Pigeon Hill and Cheatham Hill are the primary focal points. I, I'm guessing that between uh, big uh, Kennesaw Mountain, little Kennesaw was mainly artillery fighting back and forth. Artillery and was a big part of it, um, but there was some skirmish fighting there. Just uh -huh. simply nothing on scale with what happened at Pigeon Hill and Cheatham Hill. Okay. My other question is, uh, and 
the Illinois Monument there on the rise at, uh, at uh, Cheatham Hill. And I've been there where that Lee is in the rise up there. When those men got in there, how'd they get out? Did they get all become casualties that were captured, or did they the st- Southerners allow them to get away? They stay there till Johnston leaves. They stay there in the Georgian heat for about five, six days. And at nighttime, Union forces are bringing supplies forward to them. Every night, Confederates are lighting cotton balls on fire and throwing them towards the Union trenches. And they're firing when Union supplies are being brought forward. But they're going to stay there for about six days. Uh, can you comment uh, some on uh, how much Confederate cavalry might have harassed the uh, LOC of Sherman during this campaign and mm-hmm. what percentage of his forces might he had to have committed to defend the LOC? Well, I'm not sure what percentage. Um, on the day of the battle at Kennesaw, Johnston sent a long message to Richmond where, of all people, Braxton Bragg is now Jefferson Davis's military advisor. Of course, after being relieved, he was essentially promoted and given a new and better job. Um, and he sends this message to Bragg saying that at this point in the campaign, there's very little that he can do to stop Sherman, because Sherman is at this point so far into Georgia and so close to Atlanta that there really is no other good way of stopping him other than attacking Union supply lines. And there are other people who are saying this. Howell Cobb, who is an important player in the Georgia militia and the troops in Georgia, he sends a similar message to Richmond on July 1st. However, Richmond does not believe Johnston. Perhaps it's a little bit of they don't like Johnston. It's a little bit of they're spread too thin. By 1864, Confederates are just spread so so thin all across the South, they don't have necessarily the, the resources necessary for it nor do they have that important cooperative working relationship for it. So I don't know how many men they would have needed to commit to that for it to be successful, certainly more than they were willing or able to commit to it. Short, quick question. You mentioned a quote by Lieutenant Hurlbut. Is there a biological biological connection between him and General Stephen Hurlbut? Do you know of? Not that I know of. Not that I know of. First time I've ever been asked that, though, so that's good. And then you again, and then... (laughs) This is more a philosophical question. Okay, good. William Rosecrans uh, manages to maneuver Bragg out of central Tennessee and is heavily criticized for it. Um, William Sherman maneuvers Johnston out of northwest Georgia and ultimately takes Atlanta as um, Rosecrans had taken Chattanooga. Um, Yet he's praised and that campaign is still taught in uh, our service academies today. Um, what's the difference here and uh, uh, why is there such a discrepancy in how these campaigns are viewed? That's a really good question. Um, I'd say it a couple different things. Uh, Chickamauga is such a dramatic lopsided defeat that I think in the eyes of many it almost destroys Rosecrans's reputation. Um, almost if, well, look what happened at Chickamauga. His army was almost entirely dissolved there. And, of course, for Sherman, Kennesaw is a setback, but it's not on the same scale as the Union defeat at Chickamauga was. Um, Sherman, Sherman is able to deliver success at a better time for the Union war effort, perhaps. We remember those who are victors later in the wars rather than early in the wars. How many of us today remember the famous generals of uh, perhaps North Africa campaigns other than Patton? We remember the generals who are more victorious in Western Europe in World War II. So perhaps later on in the war, Sherman's fame is more lasting because of Atlanta being such a significant victory. Uh, Perhaps it's just people like Sherman's memoirs so much that they think he's awesome. I don't know. Uh, But there's a number of different different things at play there. Sherman, uh, 
Of course, his memoirs are one of the most read books on the war and thus inform the opinion of many on the war. So that's a part of it as well. All right. Well, thank you all very much.